Hello, everybody, and thank you all for coming for the third lecture of our Symposium of Aristotelian Studies, actually, our fifth, the fifth lecture of our Symposium of Aristotelian Studies. I am Professor Daniel Simon Nascimento, the organizer of this symposium and the host for this meeting. As usual, I'd like to thank FAPERG and CAPES for their financial support and the members of the research group Pragma, Uzi, and Polyphonia for their academic support. Today, we're joined by Professor Lucas Angioni, who is delivering our lecture, and to debate Professor Angioni, we have Professor Joseph Karbowski from Pittsburgh, Professor Breno Zupolini from UNIFESP, Professor Roberto Grasso from FPB, and Professor Marta Jimenez from Emory University. As you are all well aware, Professor Jimenez will be our next lecturer on the 26th of May. Soon, I'll be sending you all her title and the abstract. So let me briefly thank them all for joining us today. And without any more delay, welcome Professor Angioni to our Symposium of Aristotelian Studies. Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel, for organizing this, and thank you all for, for coming here. Uh, I have prepared a PowerPoint for this presentation, but I must confess that I'm not very familiar with the tool, so <laughs> I apologize for the amateurish aspect of it, but just a second. Um, so here it is. Uh, can you see it? Uh, can you see it, uh, Daniel? It's okay on the screen? Yes, it's okay. Uh, we can all see it. Great. So, um, so this talk is entitled Primary and Appropriate Principles in Aristotle, and its subtitle is Revisiting the Six Requirements for Demonstrative Premises in Posterior Analytics 1 2. So, I have published a paper on the six requirements uh, actually a long time ago, it's nine years now, but I'm now uh, revisiting uh, some uh, points of this paper and specifically I'm not satisfied with the argument I have made uh, back there for this uh, second requirement which is the primary and uh, more precisely I'm going to relate this uh, requirement with the notion of appropriate principle which comes uh, just uh, some uh, lines I, I had in the text. Well, but let us take a look in the text. So this is, would be my starting point in actually one of the central texts. The talk will be around just two uh, very small passages from Aristotle's text 1, text 2, text 3. There, was, there will be a, additionally a fourth text but just for uh, some complementary remarks, and this is the text one. It's from Posterior Analytics uh, chapter two, book one, and let's just skip the back enumeration, you have the text there. So demonstrative knowledge must proceed from items which are primary and indemonstrable, because otherwise we will not have knowledge of them unless you possess a demonstration of them. And to have scientific knowledge of something of which there is a demonstration, not on the basis of a concomitant factor, is to possess a demonstration of it. Now, uh, this text has been interpreted by many uh, scholars, and of course there are lots of uh, different views about it, but there is also something I can call the standard view, or maybe standard views in the plural, as you have uh, in the screen. So I'm not naming the guys here, but I'm, let us postpone that uh, discussion, but I'm, I'm making uh, this, or actually I'm presenting these three assumptions. So um, many scholars take Aristotle to be saying in this text one, that the primary and demonstrable items, uh, premises or principles are those starting points at the topmost extreme point of a demonstrative chain. So when they say this, I think that they have uh, three or four assumptions. The first assumption is that demonstration is or consists in a chain of syllogism. The second assumption is that demonstrating uh, P is or consist, consists in finding the premises that connect P with its principle up to the topmost principles. I put it in bold because this is important uh, for them. And the third assumption is that these topmost principles are or mostly include the definitions of the primitive items in the domain. Uh, 
I'm not address especially this third assumption. I'll be more focused in the first and actually in the third, in the second one. But there is also a fourth assumption which is very important to understand uh, my whole project here. So the fourth assumption is that this initial chapters of the posterior analytics, uh, maybe the 10 or the 13 first chapters of book one of posterior analytics are taken by those scholars as describing what a scientific discipline looks like. Uh, so the idea is pretty much like this. Uh, Aristotle would be engaged in a kind of um, project that could be described as I have put uh, in the parentheses. So open the box, the box of the scientific discipline to see what there is inside. So what a scientific discipline looks like, what are its ingredients, what are its uh, procedures and its constituents and its uh, general framework, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'll challenge these assumptions, as I said, not with a special focus on the third one, but let me start with the last one, the assumption uh, four, because this is important to avoid misunderstanding about uh, what, is, what is to come in my, my talk. So just to remind you, the fourth assumption is that these chapters are describing what a scientific discipline looks like, what is inside the box. And I think that this is, um, let's just say, kind of a misrepresentation of what is going on in these uh, chapters of the posterior analytics, because I take these initial chapters of the posterior analytics as uh, targeting a more particular notion, which is what you have in italics uh, in the slide. So the particular notion is um, um, scientific demonstration or explanation of a given explanandum acts within a given discipline. So what Aristotle is asking primarily in those initial chapters is this question, what it is to accomplish scientific demonstrative knowledge of a given explanandum X within a given discipline. Well, this is different from the broader concern of describing what a scientific discipline looks like. So the notion of open the box of a discipline to see what there is inside. Uh, even if these two um, uh, concerns are related, and of course they are related, they are different. So one thing is to uh, describe uh, in general what a scientific discipline looks like. Another thing more specifically is to say uh, why it is uh, for a given explanandum to have scientific demonstration of it in the full sense of the expression. And I take Aristotle to, uh, to be um, conducting uh, um, uh, research or to be searching answers for this uh, more particular question here. So as for the other assumptions, uh, let me say this, uh, chains of syllogism can be useful for expounding a scientific discipline. I'm definitely not denying that, but demonstrations, I mean, what Aristotle is exactly trying to uh, capture in the beginning of the posterior analytics, demonstrations need not be chains of syllogism. And the reason for this is the reason for challenging the second assumption. So instead of the assumption I have alternatively this, demonstrating P does not consist in connecting P with its principles up to the topmost principles. The most important thing in demonstrating P goes in the opposite direction. It consists in finding the most ap appropriate explanatory factor for the explanandum in question. And these are different things. Sometimes we find in the literature those two things are conflated. So uh, connecting a given explanandum P with its, with its topmost principles and connecting it with its most appropriate explanatory principles. I will, exp I will expand on this exactly on the talk. And um, about the third assumption, I will just say this, but I'm not uh, targeting the third assumption in this talk particularly. I would say that sometimes Aristotle uses the word proton and uh, um, uh, other words uh, related to proton to refer to things such as primitive items in the domain, for instance, in this passage from chapter 10. Uh, 
Uh, however, my point is that our text one, which is 71b, 26.9, is not one of those times when Aristotle uses protum to refer to primitive items uh, in the domain. So uh, my main idea in this, in this talk is that when Aristotle uh, uh, uses this word protum, prota in the plural, to refer to principles or to starting points of demonstration or premises or whatever, uh, what he means is not the topmost <laughs> principles, but the appropriate, and this is different. So let's take a look in text two. Uh, text two is just one sentence, it's very short. Uh, you have it in, in the screen. Uh, and uh, I read it. Uh, to proceed from primary items is to proceed from appropriate principles. So I think I, I'm taking this second passage from the posterior analytics, it's just some lines ahead after the text one. I take this passage, text two, to be uh, shedding a light on what Aristotle takes a uh, prata to mean in text one. So one might have a different approach to those two texts. Uh, one might say that, well, perhaps these two passages, text one and text two, are talking about different things and aspects, etc., and perhaps they turn out to be compatible with each other. Uh, but I prefer to explore, to explore an alternative. I also think that they are indeed compatible with each other, but the reason is different, uh, not because uh, they are talking about different aspects of principles and premises of demonstrative uh, of demonstrations, but because they are talking exactly about the same thing, namely the appropriate principles for each explanandum within a given discipline. So let me talk a little about this notion of appropriate principles by itself. Um, sometimes, so uh, sorry, first uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, preliminary remarks. Uh, sometimes oikeion, the adjective oikeion are correlated expressions are used in a weaker way. It's not much stronger than a mere possessive adjective or pronoun. Uh, but sometimes the adjective oikeion or correlated expressions are used in a stronger way. And this stronger way can be paraphrased as, as, uh, the, as we have in the screen, uh, which is this. What appropriately belongs to or is suited to a given X and to nothing else. So there are two ideas here. Uh, the one is captured by this expression, and to nothing else. So oikeion is correlated with uh, the notion of um, uh, idion, uh, as we uh, uh, have from the topics, uh, the notion of propium. So it's, it's something is a given feature that only a given x has and nothing else. Okay, in, 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 in X can be uh, cashed out sometimes as an individual, sometimes as a species, sometimes as a genus, whatever. But there is also something important about Oikeion used in this stronger way, which is not only this correlation one to one, but is the notion of uh, appropriateness and more specifically uh, the idea of a perfect fit between the Oikeion, the thing named Oikeion, and that other item to which the Oikeion thing is Oikeion, okay? And another remark I have to make is that uh, the notion of explanatory appropriateness, or alternatively, this notion of appropriate principles, is sometimes expressed by Aristotle with this uh, vocabulary of Oikeion, or Oikeia Arche, or uh, oikeion, aition, etc., etc. But this same notion can be expressed with different terminology too. For instance, uh, the principle of a given thing, uh, let's just say F, qua F, uh, or Hekaston, he, he, Hekaston, as we have in chapter 9 of book 1, for instance. So I'm not, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't need to stick with uh, oikeion as an adjective for this whole construal because. I think the notion of appropriate principle is uh, introduced not only by this expression, this adjective oikeion, but also by other, um, let's just say, uh, other parallel uh, terminology which we find in the posterior analytics. 
But then we have the important question, which is this. When we say that the principle is appropriate, the important question is, well, appropriate to what? So what is the item a principle is said to be appropriate to? Well, here is uh, something I strongly disagree with most interpretations and with the standard way of uh, uh, taking the posterior analytics. The traditional interpretation has, a, in my view, strange preference for taking Aristotle in that sentence text too, as saying that the principles must be appropriate to the domain of a scientific discipline. For instance, uh, geometry as a scientific discipline requires principles appropriate to the domain of geometry. Now, uh, now caution is needed because, of course, I'm not denying that the proposition one is true. One is indeed a true proposition within Aristotle's theory. So there is some complications about it, um, but we can skip that. There is the issue of kind crossing, uh, what does it amount to, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, Aristotle takes as true that the principles of a given discipline must be appropriate to the domain of a given discipline. But my main question and my main uh, uh, contention here is that um, what Aristotle is expressing in our text too, maybe is not this proposition one. So this is the question. Is it that proposition Aristotle is expressing in text two? And my answer is this, no, it's not this proposition that text uh, two is expressing. So let me go back just for a while to text two. Text two this just says this, uh, to proceed from primary items is to proceed from appropriate principles, so these appropriate principles there are not just principles appropriate to the scientific discipline at stake. It's something stronger than that. But if it is stronger than that, what well, is? I think that uh, what we have in text three shed a light on it. And, and I think it is important because text three comes uh, from uh, the same general passage, the same uh, passage in which Aristotle is introducing these uh, six requirements for demonstrative premises. So this is what we find in text three. Uh, for it is in this way indeed that the principles will be appropriate to what is being demonstrated or explained. Well, let me give you some context because this is, was uh, too um, uh, uh, direct here. But the context is this, uh, text three comes after Aristotle has um, enumerated the six requirements for demonstrative premises. He has just said that uh, if uh, having knowledge or having scientific knowledge is as we have considered it to be, then uh, it's necessary or scientific, um, um, sorry, uh, demonstrative science must necessarily proceed from uh, true items, that's the first requirement, primary items, that's the second requirement, immediate items, and more, no, more knowable, more intelligible than the conclusion, prior to the conclusion and cause of the conclusion. These are the six requirements. And after that, Aristotle has this remark, which is text three, as you have it uh, on the screen. I'll come back to this in my final remark in this talk. So how is the relation between these six requirements and this notion of uh, appropriate principles? But just uh, let me just remark uh, for the time being that this text three is actually naming the item to which the appropriate principle must be appropriate, okay? This, the item, the appropriate principle is appropriate to is the thing which has to be demonstrated or explained is the dignumenon. So let me move to the next slide. In this text three, uh, the dignumenon, uh, which I have translated as uh, what is uh, being demonstrated or explained, is retrieving the same notion Aristotle has expressed just some lines before with pragma, which is on its turn the explanandum what is expressed in the conclusion of a demonstration. And we have seen Perusma just some lines uh, before. So on the line of text three, 
it is clear that what Aristotle is saying in text two when he says that uh, to proceed from primary is to proceed from appropriate principles is the following. Two, this is proposition two uh, as the alternative to proposition one I have put here before. So, um, Aristotle is saying this too, principles must be appropriate to the explanandum in question. So the issue at stake here is sensitiveness to each explanandum. And this is different from, let me come back to the previous slides. This is different from this notion of being appropriate to the domain of a scientific discipline, okay? So let me move on. Uh, <clears throat> But now, uh, naturally, it arises the question, what does being appropriate to the explanation in question amounts to? Well, just in outlines, uh, appropriateness of a principle in scientific demonstration amounts to this uh, three things. First, appropriateness involves a one-to-one -one correlation. It could be co-extension or mutual implication, depending on the context and depending how we are supposed to cash out the items involved in the demonstration. But second, being appropriate with the explanandum consists in being that factor which specifically makes the explanandum what it is. And this have, has some consequences. I'm not going to explore in this talk, but if, we, if someone wants to do that in the discussion, I'll be happy to to proceed with that. The consequence is that uh, knowing why it is, so knowing the cause that makes something be uh, the way it is, is equivalent to knowing why it is, as Aristotle has said in many uh, passages from book two of the posterior analytics and actually other passages as well in the corpus. And the third point is that being appropriate to its explanandum consists in being that factor which ultimately completes the explanatory story in its culminating step. Okay, so um, these three things, I think it's uh, very, very uh, sketchy and very general outlines, but I think it is enough to give you a picture about what uh, being appropriate to a given explanandum uh, consists in for Aristotle. So let me give you an example. Uh, I'm, I'm taking this example from Posterior Analytics 2.16. Uh, take uh, Earth being in the middle as the appropriate principle of the lunar eclipse. Well, there are, as you know, some intricacies with the example and the intricacies are related to the fact that sometimes are sort of things that the uh, major term involved in the demonstration is just uh, eclipse. Sometimes are sort of things that the major term involved in the demonstration is not lunar eclipse, but uh, privation of light. But let us skip this, this uh, intricacies, at least for the time being. And in what follows, I will take a simplified outline, which is this. So I'm taking a uh, a major term in a demonstrative context which corresponds to absence of light. And what I have put into brackets is referring or alluding to those intricacies, which I, I rather <coughs> prefer to skip now. And <clears throat> the B term, the middle term, is picking up the notion of <clears throat> or just Earth being in the middle. Uh, the fact that the Earth is in the middle in the middle means between the sun and the moon. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so the questions uh, we have now is this, in order to um, cash out this notion of uh, appropriate principle, and it's exactly the notion of a principle which is appropriate to its explanandum exactly, not only appropriate to the whole domain of a discipline. So these are the questions. First, being appropriate in this way is related to being primary and demonstrable as suggested in text one. So, sorry, this was supposed as a question. This is this related to uh, being primary and demonstrable as suggested in text one. I'll come back to this um, in a minute. But first, there is a second question, which is this. How is it that an appropriate principle would be primary in proton as suggested in text two. 
So uh, the second question, which is related to text two, is uh, simpler. So I will start with it. So answering this second question, uh, the answer is that for Aristotle, an appropriate principle just is the primary cause or the primary explanatory factor. What I'm saying that Aristotle uses those expressions to uh, point to the same uh, thing. So Aristotle closely associates primary, the adjective proton in Greek, both in its absolute use and as an adjective, an adjective, for instance, of Aition, sometimes an adjective of Aitia, and sometimes an uh, adjective of something else. So Aristotle associates this uh, word with explanatory appropriateness or equivalent notions. So I have a list of passages. It will be uh, too much to discuss all the passages in this talk, but you have them there, and I, we can uh, go back to them in the discussion. But for, for the time being, I'm going to escape uh, this passage. I'm just pointing uh, to them. But while it's behind those passages in, uh, in, in common, I think they have this, this common factor, is very simple. Uh, this is the idea. The basic sense of proton, not in these passages, but uh, I mean in, in, in general, the basic sense of proton is just the idea of being the first in a given series. But, of course, what the series is and what is the criterion for building that series depends on each context. So, I can give you... Uh, some examples about uh, a different series, but I think this is uh, very clear and we can skip that and go straight to what matters most, which is the context of the posterior analytics, which is the context concerned with scientific explanation. So when the con context is concerned with scientific explanation, as surely is the case in the posterior analytics, the first is taken as the first in the explanatory series, because the series is concerned with uh, explanation. And the first in the explanatory series is cashed out as the explanatory factor such that there is no other explanatory factor between it and the explanandum. Just uh, a second. Let me expand on this just uh, for a while. Um, you don't have this in the slide, but the idea is quite simple. So suppose that you we are a kind of counting or building a series in which we have something called first proton, then something called second, deuteron, etc., and so on. Uh, the idea is that the explanandum is taken as the center or the core on which the series is built, and the first in the series is just the explanatory factor uh, between which and the explanandum, there is no other factor um, in between. That, that's the idea. So between that explanatory factor named the primary one and the explanandum it is meant to explain, there is no other explanatory factor. That's the idea. Uh, you might uh, think that this is what Aristotle has in mind when he called uh, something Amazon. Uh, this is a different story, but uh, just to uh, make make uh, the point uh, and uh, allude to the point, uh, my answer will be yes, this is what Aristotle has in mind sometimes when he uses the word Amazon, for instance, in prior, sorry, posterior analytics 2.12. Okay? But let's now move back to question two, which was what does indemonstrable and apodicton mean in text one, which was our starting point. So I'm starting with some pre preliminary remarks about options that I take to be uh, wrong about what indemonstrable means in that text. So first, uh, indemonstrable in text one does not mean not deducible from any set of two premises and does not mean uh, not discoverable from any set of two premises and it does not mean 
not liable to be justified on the basis of true premises. So what I'm saying is, is equivalent to this. Uh, Aristotle's point in text one is not about either form of features of the premises within a proof theoretic framework, for instance, as Robin Smith has it, or at least had it in the papers published a while ago. And or Aristotle's point is not about uh, discovery or about justification. Okay. So if Aristotle's concern when he calls the premises of the demonstration an apodicta in the monstrable in text one, if the concern is not with any of these three options, what is the concern then? What is Aristotle's concern then? Uh, well, so part two of the same answer is this. So I think that Aristotle's point in, in text one, when he calls uh, the premises of the demonstration or the starting point of demonstration in the monstrable, is a point about explanation for previous premises. So in other words, uh, in text one, in the monstrable means that even when there is a set of two premises from which P can be soundly deduced and discovered and justified, etc., etc. None of those premises can explain P and explain the relevant sense, which is uh, equivalent to this. None of them presents prior explanatory factors that may be what P exactly is. Okay? So this is what uh, indemonstrable means in that text. So that's that's an important uh, point, but I have to stress that what I'm saying here is not that this is the standard meaning of an apodicton in the monstrable in Aristotle. I'm not saying that Aristotle uh, everywhere else use this word with the same meaning. I'm just saying that in the text one, and I would say also in other correlated passages in the posterior analytics and maybe even other treatises, what in the monstrable uh, captures uh, in, in its context is exactly this idea that a given proposition is such that even when it is uh, deducible from other premises, when it, even when it is discoverable from other premises, and even when it can be justified by means of other premises, none of those premises from which it can be deduced, discovered, justified, etc., can explain the proposition in the relevant sense. And I'm taking here the notion of explaining as equivalent to identifying the real world factors that make the proposition at stake be exactly how it is, okay? So it's, uh, it's important to stress that I'm not taking the notion of explanation as any old explanation but as this sort of explanation which is the identification of this uh, important explanatory factors uh, that make the explanation uh, why it is and actually uh, i have in the slide a remark about a text uh, four but i have uh, to skip this but i think that uh, this point I have uh, just uh, expounded is exactly what Aristotle is making some lines ahead to uh, when he says that a premise is immediate if there is no other premise prior to it. I think that in this context, not in any context, but in this context particularly, Aristotle is cashing out this notion of immediate premise as uh, that premise uh, to which there is no no other premise explanatory prior to it in the re relevant sense for demonstrating well let us move off move on but actually back to text one again so you have the text again in this slide let me read it again so demonstrative knowledge must proceed from items which are primary and indemonstrable because otherwise you will not have knowledge of them unless you possess a demonstration of them for uh, to have scientific knowledge of something of which there is demonstration not on the basis of a concomitant factor is to possess a demonstration of it so i take the argument in this text to be quite simple and it is very straightforward in a way so in a way it is straightforward and 
easy to understand because Aristotle is blocking some kind of infinite regress. But the issue is what kind of infinite regress Aristotle is uh, willing and trying to block. Uh, this is the important question. So in order to have an answer to this, there is some uh, preliminary remarks here. Uh, just uh, wait a second for um, water. Well, the first remark is pretty obvious, but it's good to have the obvious things before you in this case. So uh, the remark is that this notion of having scientific knowledge of something not on the basis of a concomitant factor, which appears in text one, is exactly the notion Aristotle has characterized or even defined some lines before, 71b912. And just a parenthetical remark, I'm taking in text one, let me go back to, to it uh, here. I'm taking this uh, uh, here, may, sorry, uh, it doesn't, uh, let, let, let it go that way. I'm taking this Katasimbe Bekos clause here, now it has worked. As with uh, the verb epistostai and not with the on apodix is esteem. Uh, this is uh, just a detail, but if you want to discuss this later, I'm happy to. Okay, and this notion of uh, knowing something not on the basis of a concomitant factor is part of what Aristotle uh, has intended to describe or characterize or define in the beginning of chapter two. Well, the second remark is, also pretty obvious is that the notion of something of which there is demonstration uh, is equivalent to uh, the item of which uh, there is scientific knowledge the notion Aristotle has just described or defined it and this notion of uh, the item of which there is scientific knowledge corresponds to what Aristotle has previously captured with those expressions pragma some lines before simperasma conclusion and the ignimenon, uh, uh, what uh, you want to prove or what you want to explain in a given demonstration. And the third preliminary, preliminary remark is that, this is the important one, is that to possess a demonstration of, of it, namely to possess a demonstration of that of which there is demonstration, is uh, something that involves uh, the grasp of the cause or the grasp of the relevant cause. So uh, demonstration has been depicted some lines before as the syllogism that delivers scientific knowledge. But scientific knowledge on its turn, as I was insisting in my first remark here, was characterized besides other things as knowing the cause, etc., etc. And I have something to say also about the second uh, item by which scientific knowledge is characterized, but let us skip that because it's highly controversial. But uh, the consequence of this is very important. It is important because uh, uh, sometimes it's not uh, realized or it's not exactly cashed out as it should be in the literature. The consequence is that to possess a demonstration of a proposition P is to possess a syllogism that captures the cause of P. That is what uh, having scientific knowledge of P amounts to, and that what uh, having a demonstration of P amounts to, possessing a syllogism that, besides other things, satisfies the definition of scientific knowledge Aristotle has just given, and by satisfying that definition, captures the cause of P, and uh, there is other things about the necessity, but let us skip that. So, uh, let him now uh, face the argument about infinite regress, which is quite simple um, in this way. So, the idea is just this. Uh, if your premises were not indemonstrable, you will not know them unless you demonstrate them, because the proper way of knowing them would be having a demonstration of them. Thus, the consequence of this uh, you have in the two item there, um, thus, either they are prota, so the premises are prota, primary, or there will be an infinite regress. And of course, Aristotle 
does not choose the infinite regress. Aristotle chooses the uh, primariness of the premises. Thus, premises being proper are Aristotle's way of blocking the infinite regress and assuring that demonstrations are possible. So far, so good. But uh, the idea is uh, what kind of regress is involved here? Uh, and I, I, my answer is that the kind of regress involved is an explanatory regress. So what other sort of regress could be? Uh, for instance, regress in justification or regress in uh, terms of um, features of the premise in a, the in a proof theoretical framework, etc., etc. And these are actually uh, the most common views you find in the literature, for instance, uh, Robin Smith and 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 uh, many others. But I take that uh, contrary to, to that uh, or to those views in the plural, I take it that Aristotle is concerned with blocking an explanatory regress. So the idea is that the series presupposing the issue of infinite regress is a series concerned with explanation not identification sorry not justification or discovery of proof theoretical features of the premises etc etc and once more i stress that i'm taking explanation here as equivalent to identification of the factors that are the most important in making the explanation what it is so the regress our result is, is interest in blocking is of the type depicted in this text. The text comes from uh, chapter 22 of Posterior Analytics 1, and it's a very neglected chapter. And uh, uh, what he's saying is this. We seek the reason why up to this point, and then we think we have scientific knowledge, when it is not because of a further factor that the explanation comes to be or is. And I'm taking this is as meaning is what it is. For the last reason why is in this way also an ends and a limit. So, so what this text is depicting is uh, the idea of a possible, uh, sorry, is, is a regress, but is a possible infinite regress, but which is not infinite because uh, you find uh, some, um, let's just say, finishing answer that uh, completes the whole explanatory story so that your explanandum uh, is what it is or happens to be what it is or sometimes comes to be not because of a further factor so the factor you have then named is the last one or it is the first one it depends just on the uh, perspective you are uh, uh, so to speak, uh, counting them or naming them in a series. So an important consequence of all this uh, is that uh, identifying the primary principles or the primary premises is something explanatory sensitive. That's very important to stress and it seems obvious, but it's not. So identifying the primary premises is not something that the expert will do once for all and repeat with the same content somewhat automatically for any new theorem. Uh, so what I'm saying here is this. So suppose a Porphyrian tree and suppose that the primary premises are on the top of it. So given that it is a Porphyrian tree, uh, the, expert in, the expert in that discipline would not um, have the need to uh, do it again, uh, the identification of those primary premises, once he uh, reaches uh, the topmost uh, principles, once he uh, attain the identification of those primary premises. Because those primary premises, in this way of understanding primary premises, would be common to all the items in the domain. So it is enough for the expert to identify the, premises, the primary premise once for all, because those primary premises will be primary for all the items in the domain. So when the uh, expert would more particularly demonstrate a particular explanandum within that discipline, he would or he or she would have to just to repeat 
the same content for this primary premises and to apply them to the new theorem. So this is the idea I am rejecting. I'm saying that identifying the primary premises has nothing to do with this, with identifying uh, that topmost item in a Porphyrian tree. And so that once you have identified it, you can just uh, uh, reproduce the same uh, propositional content for any uh, new explanation you have to explain. So my idea, alternatively, my uh, contention is that identifying the primary premises is something that the expert uh, should do for any, sorry, for not for any, for each new explanandum. So the expert should specify differently, with different content, the appropriate and primary premises for each explanandum. For each explanandum has its own appropriate cause that primarily makes it what it is. So given that appropriate cause and primary principles, primary premises are pointing to the same notion, this means that for each, for each explanandum, the expert has to identify the primary premises that primarily makes the explanandum what it is. Okay. Uh, let's move on. So um, now let me offer you a brief characterization of what those primary premises are and what they are not. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching the, the end of my talk now. So first, what they are not. Let us say that identifying the primary premises according to the notion found in those texts 1 and text 2 has nothing to do with finding the starting points of syllogistic chains. So it will have more to do with finding the finishing points, not the starting points of syllogistic chains, okay? Uh, not the finishing uh, points in the sense that it would be the, for instance, the major term, but the finishing point uh, in relation to a given explanandum, okay? Second, uh, Identifying the primary premises has nothing to do with finding the definitions of the basic items in the domain. And of course, the expert must find these definitions, etc., etc., for they are to uh, retrieve the metaphor I have used in the beginning. Uh, these definitions are inside the box of a scientific discipline. But my point is that in text one and text two, Aristotle is focused on a more specific issue why it is to have scientific knowledge of a given explanandum within a given discipline. So Aristotle is not describing what a scientific discipline looks like. And finally, identifying the primary premises uh, has uh, nothing to do with finding the topmost principles that are common to everything in the domain. And again, the same content, sorry, the same comment applies. Uh, these topmost principles common to everything in the domain are inside of the box. And of course, the expert must know them and the expert must have them uh, at hand when they, they uh, prove to be useful, the expert has to activate them, etc. But this is not what Aristotle is describing in the text in question. Now, for what the notion of primary and appropriate premises or principles uh, positively uh, are. So a primary premise, according to both text one and two, is the premise that is explanatory, explanatory primary. And it is explanatory primary because it identifies the factor that is the most important one in making the explanation what it is the factor that finishes the explanatory story that covers what the explanandum is exactly in itself. Uh, for example, lunar eclipse, uh, Earth being in the middle, uh, i.e. between the sun and the moon, is the factor that is the most important one in making lunar eclipse what it is, a specific type of privation of light in the moon. The primary appropriate major term Sorry, the primary appropriate major premise in the demonstration of the lunar eclipse will look like this. So I'm skipping here some intricacies, but this will be uh, the, 
the major premise. This specific type of privation of life, the major term, belongs, hipparche, let us skip that, to the earth in the middle, which is the middle term. Now, remember that uh, for that premise, which is the, the major premise of a demonstrative syllogism, being explanatory primary and appropriate is compatible with being deducible from other premises, being discoverable from other premises, and being justifiable by other premises. So there's a lot of difficulties involved here, and I think I don't have uh, more time to uh, expand on this, so I'm probably it's, it's better to leave that to the uh, discussion, and I can clarify the notion as the questions uh, come up. But just some final remarks. Uh, my final remark is about the six requirements for the demonstrative premises as we find them in uh, chapter two of book one of the posterior analytics. It's just uh, something I would like to add here uh, that doesn't uh, depends strongly on uh, uh, what I have said so far. And you might be convinced, for instance, of uh, the, the 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 whole of my talk and reject this final remark but anyway i'm going to to state it which is this one might think that the relation between the six requirements and being appropriate to the explanandum as aristotle uh, affirms it in text three is something like this so you have the sum of the six requirements taken together, and the sum of them is equivalent to being appropriate. So um, the idea is uh, once a given premise is not only true, but also primary, is the second requirement, immediate or indemonstrable, the third requirement, uh, cause, or the four, uh, prior, the fifth, and more remote and more intelligible than the conclusion, the six, once they are um, the six things together, or, or once they satisfy these six requirements jointly together, uh, they turn out to be appropriate to the explanatum. Okay, well, this is a very attractive idea. So that will be equivalent to say that each of the a requirement by itself, taken by itself, is just a sine qua non, but not sufficient condition for being appropriate, while the whole of them, the six taken together, would be not only sine qua non condition, but also sufficient condition for being appropriate. Okay? Well, I, I'm suggesting a different picture. I leave aside the first requirement about being uh, true because it's more more complicated, and actually I believe that it is out of the following claim I'm going to make now, which is this. I think that the situation depicted by Aristotle in the second chapter of book one of the Posterior Analytics is uh, different from what I have just uh, referred to. I would say that properly understood in its context, any one of the five requirements well, let me leave the true aside. Any one of these five requirements is such that it can be itself cashed out in terms of being appropriate. So the idea is that being primary in the relevant sense corresponds to being appropriate. And this is not uh, the same as saying that Aristotle uses primary only in this way. I'm not saying this. Aristotle uses primary in many ways, but in those three texts I have um, explored in this talk, in this context, being primary is equivalent to being appropriate, and then the same thought might be repeated to the other uh, four remnant requirements. So being indemonstrable in this context amounts to being appropriate, being uh, immediate, which is just a rephrasement of being indemonstrable, maybe amounts to being appropriate, being the cause amounts to being uh, appropriate principle, and the same for being prior, the same for being non-remoteron. But this is another uh, story. I'm just flagging it in, uh, flagging it and leaving to the discussion. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and for the
amateurish uh, aspect of this uh, PowerPoint, which is, by the way, is my first PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, I'm sure everybody appreciates that this has been actually a historical event, you know, because it is the first PowerPoint. Oh, what happened with, okay, I think our math is here. Everybody's on the screen now. For a minute there, I thought I had lost some of you. Okay, so uh, the first question is Breno, uh, then we go to Joe, but Joe asked for a minute uh, for his question. Breno, you can begin. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Lucas, for your presentation. Um, I would like you to clarify what do you mean by the topmost principle in your characterization of the opponent's uh, interpretation? Because I have the impression that there are a lot of interpretations in the literature that fit uh, the profile you described at the beginning as the, as the wrong interpretation. Uh, but that actually are compatible with uh, almost everything that you have, not everything, but perhaps almost everything that you have said after that. And what I mean by that is the following. Uh, you have presented uh, interpretation of the indemonstrability of, of scientific principles that is in agreement with what several interpreters think, I, I guess. So it, uh, an indemonstrable premise is I need the most premise is a premise that cannot be explained uh, from prior premises that are prior from a, a causal point of view. Uh, I agree with that. And I think many others interpreters, I mean, uh, at least I think David Bronstein, David Charles, uh, Miles Burney, Cosman, uh, they, they will all agree with your interpretation of indemonstrability. And uh, and it seems that uh, a, a premise, if a premise is in the most room in this sense, it is a kind of, it occupies a top position in a foundationalist structure, nonetheless. Uh, because simply, if, if you think of demonstration, if you think of a demonstration in which one of the premises is not demonstrable, so there's not there's not a further demonstration of that premise, uh, that means that. Um, that means that in this structure, it, it, its position in the structure is like at the top. So I don't quite understand the top-down analogy. I, I don't think the visual picture is very useful because if we think of uh, Aristotle, uh, I, perhaps if not all examples of demonstration of the posterior analytics, at least the, the most important demonstrations are examples of syllogisms in which at least one of the premises is, is indemonstrable in this sense, in the sense that you accept. For instance, the, the planet example in one thirteen, or the lift shedding example in book two, or the eclipse example, they are all uh, they, they are all demonstrations in which one of the premises is uh, uh, indemonstrable in the sense of not being susceptible uh, of to scientific explanation from more basic premises. So I would like you to clarify a little bit what you mean by the topmost principles, because uh, there is a way of, of interpreting the, the, the initial picture that is compatible, I think, uh, with your own view of, of how things work. So um, it, it seems you mentioned Robin Smith, but Robin Smith has a very peculiar interpretation of, of the analytics. And, uh, and I can see that his view is incompatible with what you were proposing, but anyway. Okay, thank you, Breno. Uh, in fact, there is uh, more in the, the, in the literature I have, but in the, the slides. So um, actually, the views like uh, David Charles, yours, and uh, Cosman, blah, 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 are not meant as the target there. So I am I have in mind, uh, I would like to avoid names, but <laughs> if, if names are necessary, let's just say, uh, hi, Klaus, uh, let's just say Robin Smith, but also you find Terry Irwin, uh, Christopher Reeve, and uh, 
And also, well, well, there's something weird about the posterior analytics because there are some uh, scholars focus on specific research on the posterior analytics. We agree a lot of things, but when you find <laughs> scholars uh, uh, looking for uh, things in the more general literature about the posterior analytics, sometimes they rely on more general accounts found in companions and more general books and you know what I mean? And then these guys are really my target, like the ones I have just uh, mentioned. But they, what they have in mind is this notion of the primitive items in the domain. So uh, you have to have the definition of them, and then uh, uh, it's easy to organize the uh, whole uh, branch of uh, discipline in terms of a porphyrian tree in which you are going just to repeat the same prepositional content you have in those topmost principles for the more particular explananda. And of course, this is not uh, what David Charles, David Bronstein, you, Cosman, a lot of other people uh, think. But uh, as for uh, you guys, let's just say <laughs> in this way, uh, the disagreement I still have I think I still have or maybe not not maybe not with all of you because it's uh, um, at least you are kind of a group in the literature but I still have something which I think it's different um, of course I'm very happy to find you in the literature uh, because it's different from this more uh, general uh, picture but I still have this difference I think that when Aristotle is um, calling the premise of the demonstrative syllogism, uh, an apodicton, indemonstrable. Uh, he is uh, not only thinking of a relation of that premise with possible uh, superior premises from which it could be explained, but this is in the counterfactual, but he is also looking for uh, sorry, she's not looking. He is uh, 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 taking attention, paying paying attention to the explanandum and to the relation between that premise and the explanandum. Let me try to uh, say the same thing with other words. So um, maybe in the view you have characterized uh, in the monstrable is a feature that we can uh, um, attribute to a given proposition without taking into consideration the relation it has with a given explanandum, okay? Uh, it's not the same as with truth, because truth, if I propose to you a proposition and ask you to react, it is true or false. You don't have to look, well, let me see if there is a further premise from which it can be deduced. We can react, well, it's false or it's true. In the multiple, it's not like this, because if I ask you, it is, in the monstrable or not, you have to think about uh, a given context, which in this case is in existence um, of premises, which would explain uh, the, 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 the proposition named in the monstrable. So let's just say, you, 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 we, we all agree, I think, with this picture. There are uh, premises from which then the monstrable premises can be soundly deduced and it can be soundly discovered and can, it can be justified by means of those premises. But those premises are not explaining the indemonstrable premise. That's good. But my contention is that uh, you can talk all of this, you can attribute indemonstrability to this premise without any consideration uh, to the relation this premise has with a given explanandum. Maybe I'm wrong with this. Uh, maybe uh, some guy in the literature has stressed this. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember the details about, uh, for instance, Cosman, et cetera, et cetera. But my contention is that when I start to call this demonstrative premises indemonstrable, he might uh, have in view uh, also something else, which is this, um, which is captured in terms of this relation with a given explanandum. So the the premise at stake is in the bounceable, 
because there is okay there is no one no other premise superior to that from which it can be uh, explained but the fact is that uh, uh, yes a uh, proposed uh, explanatory factor for a given explanandum that premises is uh, paying the bill is suiting uh, the 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 role it has to to play and that is what I uh, call it is that's why I sort of call it in the monstrable so um the whole story about this would rely on the uh, let's say relative interchangeability between an apodicton and amazon which is not uh, something uh, Easy is not to uh, avoid, or, sorry, it's not uh, without controversies. But um, given that, I'm relying not in this talk, but on a large project in uh, what Aristotle says in Posterior Analytics 2 12 and other passages where he has uh, this idea of the, let's like say, the explanandum being the center of a lot of things we are going to say about uh, premises that have some kind of cognitive access to the explanandum and he's going to say that the proton and the amazon is that uh, which does not admit any intermediate and this intermediate is understood in explanatory terms so you have the explanandum as a term of reference and then you have a kind of series of uh, things that you can uh, relate to the, to the explanandum in many ways but when the way is explanator explanation so you are relating those items with the explanandum from the point of view of explanation there is one item there you call proton and amazon and i would say this is the anapodicton as well that is uh, called an apodicton and amazon and proton because there is no explanatory intermediate between and of course you are right in pointing that this is compatible with everything you have said before about the your views about being in the most i don't know if this so uh, yes so nice. two things uh, i'd like to add so it's clear to me now the disagreement um uh so thank you for that uh and I would like to emphasize that yes, there, the two views are are compatible. So, uh, and my question would be: Do you, do you accept that uh, those premises that are primary in your sense are also indemonstrable in the sense that you they they are at the top of a foundationless st structure after all? Because if you take, for instance, the minor premise in the planet planet example, or the or the major premise in the eclipse syllogism, or the major premise in the thunder syllogism, and so on, they are indemonstrable in the so-called more in, in my sense or Bronstein sense, or uh, and also uh, what made me uh, confused about that issue is that on your slide 17 and 18 it seems you are characterizing indemonstrability in the in the way I formulated it in the question. So you're saying that a proposition P is indemonstrable when there's no other proposition that explains it. <laughs> so a P is indemonstrable if there is not a pair of premises that would be able to e explain P, right? So uh, perhaps there is a, another flavor to the notion this, that would be like where you were just explaining that there is no gap between the premise and the conclusion so there's no intermediate premises require uh, required between the 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 premise and the conclusion but it it seemed to me that in you you also accept the more traditional view that uh, a premise is indemonstrable if it is not susceptible to scientific explanation which is a more more common way of understanding the term. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're so, right. So, uh, so we have two two flavors of the same, like two aspects of the same notion. I, I I'm not sure how they sort of combine. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, this slide seventeen uh, it was meant as a step. Uh, towards this uh, further characterization of indemonstrability with connected with explanandum sensitiveness. 
And I think that uh, it depends on the context. I will start with putting more stress on the, this more uh, traditional view, as you call it, or in this thing I'm uh, stressing here uh, as my my contention. But so you also mentioned something about the top. Uh, so if I would agree that those premises that are explanatory appropriate are the top in one sense. Well, if you mean being in the top as just being the major premise, of course, I, I accept that. So <laughs> you have the conclusion uh, here <laughs> and you have the premises uh, um, not below, but <laughs> up. And uh, in this sense, you might say that the premises are in the top. But I think that when normally we find this topmost vocabulary uh, activated in the literature, they mean, well, go further in the demonstrative chain, go in your Porphyrian tree uh, to the uh, uppermost thing uh, in the domain of the discipline. And this is something it doesn't make too much sense to me. Even in, with the even with the major premise of the eclipse example, for instance, we have two terms that are connected by definition. Or, for instance, take the minor premise in the planet syllogism. We have a, oh. a, a middle term, which is definition of the minor term. That's what I mean. So it seems that okay. if, if we have the fact that uh, even if we think in terms of a demonstrative chain, uh, chain is it? It's perfectly possible for there being an indemonstrable premise in each step of the of the chain, right? So, mm -hmm. if you take the eclipse syllogism, for instance, uh, the major term, the major premise, sorry, could be indemonstrable in the traditional sense. There is no demonstration of it, so it kind of blocked the regress on that branch of the demonstrative yes, chain. Yes, yes. Perhaps something else is happening with the minor premise. The, perhaps the minor premise is demonstrable. We don't know that, but. At least the major premise has a definitional connection between the terms. And it, 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 some interprets take it to be like implying that the major premise is indemonstrable. So it sort of blocks the regress. So it is a, at the top. So that's why uh, at the top in the sense that it is a, a limit, an end in, yeah. in the bottom up direction. Uh, yeah. uh, and there is no further demonstration of it. Yeah, oh, I agree with all of this uh, you you are describing, but I think that the, what we find in the literature is, uh, well, maybe with your exception, maybe David Charles' exception, and maybe Cosman and a few others, but what we most commonly find in the literature is uh, this idea of being in the top uh, in a Porphyrian tree. So this is I want to avoid because uh, being being indemonstrable is connected with being appropriated. Being appropriate is uh, always relative to a given explanandum. And being appropriate is not a transitive relation. It is just the principle is appropriate to a given explanandum, full stop. There is no way of uh, a principle for demonstration being appropriate to more than one explanandum, unless, well, there is those things about 217 homonymy, then you uh, uh, gather them together with a different description, but this is a different story. Let me, it's for normal case. What I'm saying that is the appropriate principle you mobilize to uh, demonstrate a given explanandum will not, is not going to be repeated in its propositional content to explain a different explanandum. In that step, you are not willing to make, uh, but that step uh, we find uh, sometimes in the the literature. Just the, let me just add something. Maybe it's uh, it's um, enlightening. I'm not sure it is enlightening or not. But uh, Barnes has a remark on his commentary on chapter two. He has, he says that Aristotle is annoying or enerving. He uses vocabulary uh, like this, very funny. Aristotle has an enerving ambiguity uh, when he talks about this uh, premises. Uh, and the ambiguity involves uh, uh, the, the notion of uh, premise from which the conclusion is most directly obtained. Uh, 
and the premises from which uh, the demonstration ultimately depends. So there the are more remote principles at uh, the other extreme of the chain. So this is binds. So one point of one sorry one way of putting my difference with uh, this. Uh, remark of Barnes is to say that I don't see any evidence that Aristotle is talking about in one two about those uh, further premises or this uh, this topmost premises on which the demonstration ultimately depends in this sense. I think Aristotle is talking about those. Uh, let us use this vocabulary: the proximate premises. Actually, the two premises. Uh, uh, from which the, the syllogism uh, uh, proceeds. And uh, wh wh why I'm saying this, because what we find in the literature sometimes is a conflation between these two perspectives. So um, I would agree with what you have said about the major premise being uh, at the top, uh, because it blocks the infinite regress chain, etc., etc. But sometimes... Uh, People in the literature does not realize that how this is connected with the sensitiveness to each explanandum so that you cannot repeat that same prepositional content to explain uh, a given, uh, a, given a, a different explanandum. Unless the explanandum is just a specification, which is not really a different one, but well, that's is, that is it. So, but, uh, okay, thank you, Lucas. Okay, so uh, here in our, in our queue we have now uh, Marta, your question, please. Thank you, Lucas, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brenda, for your questions, too. Um, I have a, a relatively general question. Um, I, When you establish this contrast between um, the the interpretation that you want to uh, get rid of that is that uh, uh, um, appropriate to the appropriate is used as appropriate to the discipline that's the one that you want to get rid of and you want to in, like uh, present instead or like substitute it by appropriate to the explanation um i started thinking about like what could motivate people to think that what he means is appropriate to the discipline and uh, an immediate connection is the kinds of comments that he made, methodological comments that he makes uh, at the beginning of the Eudemian ethics, for example, uh, where it seems, or at least like maybe you want to interpret, like read that in a different way, but it sounds like uh, uh, there are several uses of OK on there where it's just like, it sounds like he's doing like a prop, like he's using it as like appropriate to the, to the discipline or like he uses the term pragmatos so i don't know whether that can go both ways but uh but uh but the the the, the idea is that um for example in eudemian ethics 1 6 he talks about how people get misled by like crappy arguments uh because they're not able to distinguish the kind of uh the kind of explanations that are um appropriate and he uses the term okay okay as there and 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 uh at, at least in like a, in most translations it's just as appropriate to the discipline um it is the 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 the, the, the greek says uh okay uh to pragmatos so it might be just like that it goes both ways um but i was wondering so that is kind of like what it started me thinking about like whether it might be possible that uh you can read the okay as like a doing both jobs so like in different ways it might be that uh, sometimes it is just like okay is using that restricted way as a, a, a appropriate to the explanandum and in other occasions is used as appropriate to the discipline and in other occasions it's kind of like an in between or like it means both things and like aristotle is kind of like famous for doing this kind of thing for having like a broad sense and a narrow sense and this is moving from the one to the other so that wouldn't take away from the fact that in this specific passage that you're interpreting he's using it in in this in this narrow sense but it would just like explain why people have been interpreting that broader sense uh that's the question okay thank you very much marta that's very important because i have to stress which i didn't in the talk uh, 
But I have to stress that um, uh, this way of my way of taking uh, how we can appropriate to the explanando, uh, as far as I see things, it entails the other way, the traditional way. So my point is not that um, it's wrong to say that Aristotle uh, wants uh, principles appropriate to the domain of the discipline in general. Uh, what I'm saying is that, well, it's more, it's stronger than that, more specific than that. But then this more specific way of using Oikeion actually entails, um, I don't see how it couldn't, it couldn't entail. Because, as a, for instance, if you are uh, uh, using a given principle to explain a given problem in a given discipline, uh, something whatever about uh, why animals move in this way or that, uh, then Aristotle will say that, well, your principles must be appropriate to the explanation at stake. Uh, you cannot bring principles that belong to a different story within the same discipline. And those principles appropriate to the explanation would be ipso facto. Maybe I'm wrong in this, but I think that they would be automatically appropriate to the whole domain of the discipline as well. Um, but but this is an important point to to stress because um, sometimes when we uh, deny that Aristotle is making some point in a given text, uh, people think that we are denying the propositional content of uh, of the you know, at stake, and that's not what I mean. So I, what I mean is this: I'm not denying that Aristotle sometimes uses Oikeion in broader senses. And I'm, I'm denying that in this passage of the posterior analytics, he's using Oikeion in this broader sense. And it's my narrow sense entails the broader sense. But as for the Eudemian ethics, I think that he's using the expression in exactly the same way as he's using in the posterior analytics. I think it's uh, uh, Oikeion appropriates to each uh, thing you want to explain. It's not just uh, to the domain. This is a more complicated issue, but uh, I think that he's using in, in in the same way. And uh, of course, a lot depends on how pragma is taken. And I'm taking pragma in all those occurrences and also other occurrences which are relevant to comparison, like Sofishki Elenki, for instance. I'm talking. I'm taking all those occurrences of pragma uh, to introduce uh, the notion of an explanandum within a scientific domain, not the notion of a domain. It might be domain in some cases. I'm not denying that, too. Pragma sometimes is the definiendum, sometimes is uh, uh, something with prepositional content, sometimes is the, the whole subject matter, the domain of a discipline, but sometimes it is the uh, explanandum you are most interested in, in explaining. And I think this is uh, what happens in the uh, Udemian ethics too. <laughs> yeah, so if I may, a, a small follow up. I think, like, I think that's right, and there's an ambiguity there that 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 I wanted you to just like see what side are you are you are you leaning. Uh, but I, I'm kind of like maybe because I'm too influenced by the way in which this text has been read traditionally. I I, I am kind of like I wanna keep keep both at the same time. So I agree that you can read. And it is like the one way of not being fooled in this particular case of the Eudemian passage, one way of not being fooled by bad arguments is by just like being alert to the fact that the explanation has to be appropriate to, to that the explanation has to be as appropriate to the particular explanandum. But uh, I was thinking a little bit about like, like the Socratic person that is able to just like identify identify bad arguments, even if they don't know the answer, or even if they don't know exactly what fits the particular explanation. So like being aware of what fits, like what kind of language fits and fits in the particular situation, or what kind of uh, appealing to what kinds of things fits in the particular situation is different than knowing the particular explanation for this particular explanation. So that's why I wanted to just like maybe leave it open uh in that in that text that doesn't mean that like in the particular text that you want to use goes that way but then like it seems that there is a flexibility of interpretation there okay uh, well uh just a final remark as i as i as i said i think that 
this narrow way of taking appropriate to the explanandum entails the other a broader way of taking it. So I think it, that will be uh, maybe enough for you to be happy with with this with, with what you want. I think it's preserved. What you want to preserve is preserved by this by this narrow view entailing the uh, broader uh, way of taking uh, Oikeion. But okay, we can talk about that later. Okay. Okay, so we have two more questions, one from Roberto for Klaus. Before we go to the audience, where we all have we really have one question by Paulo waiting. So Roberto, it's you now. Thank you. And thank you, Lucas. My question is very general, not at all technical, and uh, probably it will reflect or betrays the kind of superficial understanding that I have about the analytics, but I will uh, I will ask you this question nonetheless. So I, I was thinking about what is the actual outcome of all these uh, requirements that Aristotle is theorizing about what is a demonstration and explanation. And I was thinking in particular how many uh, items, let's say in Aristotle's ontology, understanding of the reality, can, after all, uh, appear in his explanations, if he has to respect all these requirements. And I was thinking, okay, even if we uh, think about the specificity of the explananda in the various cases, particular specific cases, I was thinking, in the end, there are not so many items that he will use in explanations if he has to respect all these requirements. But then I, I was thinking maybe I'm getting it completely wrong. So this is why I'm asking you these questions. Uh, if I'm getting it right, the things that can respect all these requirements are stuff like the elements, uh, the combinations of elements that he calls mixes and other types of combinations and the, let's say, emergent uh, dispositions that they have. And then we have souls. And if, if we don't go for like unmoved movers and mathematical entities, that's it. I mean, uh, when I was thinking about all these requirements in your explanation, all these requirements, I was thinking it must be one of these things that Aristotle can use in explanations. But then I have this doubt, maybe I'm getting it completely wrong. Uh, and this is why I'm asking you, am I getting it completely wrong? Am, am I am reading it in a very naive way? Am, am I being too restrictive? Uh, and the reason is because in the end, it seems it doesn't make much of a difference if we want to, talk, to call all these things as the first principles or the topmost principle in Aristotle ontology or not. Uh, but at, at the end, it's just this stuff that you can use, these types of items that he can actually use in Aristotelian explanations. I don't know if it makes sense, but this is my doubt. Okay, thank you, Robert. Well, actually, um... But this is a very complex question, and I, I have not addressed in in the talk, and I think it's not the the right text, uh, posterior analytics one two to to focus on if you are interested in this. But I would say that uh, even being a, a legitimate question, I think that maybe Aristotle is not so worried by that in the posterior analytics. I I I, 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 I what I mean is this. So the notion of explanation Aristotle has in mind is strongly intentional uh, in a way that is um, not, uh, you know, that is my view at least, not uh, interested in uh, reduction to this, uh, let's say, ontological furniture, which applies. I'm not saying that, well, the ontological reduction would be uh, completely crazy. No, take the example of the lunar eclipse. Let us assume, just for the sake of argument, that the Earth being in the middle is uh, the appropriate explanatory factor for the lunar eclipse. But 
it is legitimate to ask, but why is the Earth being in the middle after all? It's just a bunch of elements. Suppose that we have a big sphere with the four elements there <laughs> floating in the outer space. No, not the outer space, but floating in, in, not floating, but being in some way in the universe. So this, you have the Earth, uh, properly speaking, the element Earth. Then you have the air and the, the water, air and the fire, this, this uh, whole sphere, which we call the planet Earth. And you have a lot of, I don't know, ether, uh, the, the, the five elements in the celestial spheres, etc. And this is it. Uh, and if you, if probably if you ask Aristotle about what, why, why is this Earth being in the middle from the point of view of an ontological furniture? He would say something like this. Well, you know, it's just four elements and ether and blah, 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 blah. But the question is, it is in under that description that we should present them as giving the explanation for the lunar eclipse. And then I think Aristotle will say, no. Uh, of course, it is true that those things are uh, uh, the, those basic elements. I mean, the Earth being in the middle actually reduces from the ontological point of view to elements being a given place, blah, 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 blah. But is this the correct way of putting uh, the of phrasing, formulating uh, the explanatory factor of the lunar eclipse? I thought to say, I, I guess I, I was thought to say no. Uh, the proper way of formulating the explanatory factor uh, does not need to pay attention to this. Uh, let's say further analysis in terms of on, ontological furniture. Uh, well, this might be very controversial, but at least this is the way I I take Aristotle's um, theory of demonstration. I, I hope this clarifies. Yeah, uh, I see my difficulty is uh, if not mentioning, for example, in this example, not mentioning the elements, Earth, and all this story would uh would not represent a uh, uh, misidentification of what is the uh, not demonstrable account of for example the eclipses like if you say okay because the earth is in the middle okay and then why is the earth in the middle okay i i guess yeah uh, i'm Taking it as okay, the, the explanation of why the Earth is in the, is the middle explains the eclipse, but this is not the case in your in your view, right? It, so if you, you explain one thing, you get the explanation, and that's it. Then if you move to uh, another question, is another explanation? Is it is it like that? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Okay. I guess. Well, and, well, well. well in a nutshell, I think that uh, uh, this sort of, let's just call it ontological analysis, is something that Aristotle might think useful in some uh, theoretical branches, in some sciences. Of course, if you have meteorologica in mind, that would be uh, relevant, in not, not at large, but at least in some uh, specific issues, etc. But... Um, It, yeah, it depends on context. Uh, you 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 name the one of the four elements as uh, the very thing it is. For instance, fire uh, or earth or uh, air. It depends on the context, I, I think. So, for instance, uh, to explain why uh, animals are mortal, maybe it's relevant to uh, mention fire, etc., as the basic element on which the vital heat depends, blah, 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 etc., etc. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, a whole analysis, uh, in the sense you are suggesting, an uh, ontological analysis, is what Aristotle takes to be the desideratum of appropriate explanation. I see. But you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But it, but it, but it's, it's, it's important that you have raised this question because at some points it might be really important that this ontological analysis also uh, been uh, been uh, done because but because it is important for the explanation in question. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have Joe back now. He, he was missing for a minute. So we still have a question by Klaus. One question by Joe that he had, he raised his hand a while ago. And then we will go to the audience, promise to you all. So please, Klaus, okay. your question. Okay. Well, um, hi, Joe. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Lucas, thank you so much for this uh, talk. Um, I thought it was very clear and I enjoyed it. Um, but I was a little late. So I apologize for that. I, I just came home. Um, and so my question, my first question, um, I have two questions, and my first question has been largely covered by Marta's question. Um, I tend, I think I very much sympathize with your idea of making all these requirements relative to the um, explanandum, the degnumenon. De uh, and I think that's right, and this is because this is also what the text says. <laughs> uh, so it's okay, uh, uh, to degnumenu or something. And, um, and um, that is not the, the scientific domain. It is uh, the thing that you want to prove. Um, so I agree with that, and I think that's right, and I think it also explains um, uh, much what is going on in terms of examples. For example, 124, where you have a single episode of a human action being sort of explained with reference to principles and so on and so forth. And, and that is not false under the domain of no science whatsoever, it seems to me, because it's a single event. Um, and, and these, and I like that, I think that's rather a, a great advantage of your approach. Um, and my questions would have been questions of the sort that Marta posed, namely, how does that relate to the old model that you described with the Porphyrian tree? And uh, but you already answered that question, oh, it's included. And I think that's very important and you really need to emphasize that. Um, and it, maybe it would uh, be interesting to say, think more about how um, these two sort of ways of going about understanding this um, overlap or relate to each other. Because it seems to me that even if you explain episodes of you know human locomotion or something, um, uh, if you arrive at the topmost principle relative to that particular explanandum, mm -hmm. you will unfailingly perhaps uh, make reference or uh, uh, refer to some principle of a science. You will be talking science, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, since that question has been asked and you answered that question, um, my other question uh, regards the part of it that I think I didn't really uh, follow because I wasn't at home as of yet. And this is um, in, in your summary, uh, you, you were saying these things, I mean, I mean, one, two is a mess in a way, and people don't know what to make of this overkill of criteria because they largely overlap. And so, and you have a very nice way of uh, thinking about it in a new kind of spirit. And I really like that, and I have to think more about it. Um, but then you were suggesting this thing that each of these conditions, safe aletheia, um, is sufficient. And that I really didn't understand. Because um, like, for example, priority is a relative notion. And um, if, you, if you just take it at face value, then any prior premise would be good enough and okay on for the explanandum. And that's not what you want to say. You want to say that's the immediately prior premise. And, um, and, and, and my question is that, how, uh, how do you uh, go about you know, catching this out in the terms of the sufficiency of each of these six requirements, first question, second question, you really have to say something about the Aleta requirement. <laughs> uh, thanks, Klaus, very important things. Um, well, um, let's skip Aleta here, let's postpone to the, to the end of my answer. But as for the, the, the idea in my final remarks, this is just uh, actually very, very sketchy in very outlines in my, in my slides, but I have thought about this, and, but the idea is this. Uh, taking Aletheia uh, outside the picture, at least provisionally, all the five uh, expressions uh, for the 
requirements of demonstrative premises are um, uh, subject to uh, different uses by Aristotle himself. Aristotle uses those expressions differently. And of course, um, there are many contexts in which um, the what exactly Aristotle wants to say by using those expressions has to be cashed out very differently and has nothing, maybe has nothing to do, is too strong, but at least does not deliver appropriateness of the principles, explanatory appropriateness. But my contention is that um, Aristotle is using those expressions here in this chapter and some passages elsewhere uh, too, in such a way that um, to uh, say that a premise is primary in the relevant way just is another way of saying that it is appropriate. And now you repeat for all of these other requirements, saying that the premise is prior in the relevant way is just to say that that premise has the right sort of priority, which is important here, which is causal priority in the way our sort of cashes out in the, for instance, prior analytics 113 and categories 12, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this gives you explanatory uh, appropriateness. The same might be said, which is more difficult with Gnori Motoron. That's the, maybe the most difficult case. And the same might be said with Amazon, actually, Breno has said that in, in his paper recently uh, published, and uh, actually he has been saying this for <laughs> a long time. So that's that, that, that's uh, the way of putting this. But I'm not I'm not claiming, of course, that Aristotle systematically uses those four, five, sorry, five expressions for the requirements uniformly, even uh, inside the posterior analytics. And I'm not saying that Aristotle is not aware of possible, um, uh, not only mistakes, but also some um, um, uh, bad moves that someone might say, like for instance, uh, one might say that, oh, well, I have uh, primary premises in the wrong way of being primary. I have immediate premises in the wrong way of being immediate. That's what we have in one nine, for instance. And then one might say, aha, I have premises which are primary, indemonstrable, immediate, so I have a demonstration. So I sort of would say, oh, hold on, that's the inappropriate. <laughs> so that's the wrong way of being primary, indemonstrable, and immediate. It's not what I meant when I talk about the six requirements. But this is the, the whole story. I have not cashed, cashed out it uh, uh, yeah, so far. But as for Aletheia, uh, I think that a very close story might uh, run for a letter too, but not maybe not in the this chapter of the posterior analytics. The, the story is pretty much like this. There is a way in which Aristotle uses aletes as adjective of premise and just this just mean what we all know that it means <laughs> so as you find in the Paulo Carvalho's book, and uh, it doesn't depend on the controversy with David Charles, Michael Peramatis about truth bearers, blah, 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 blah. It's just what it means uh, to say that the premise is true, a proposition is true. But there are some cases in which uh, Aletes is used as an adjective, and that use might be pointing to something uh, which is the fact that the premise you are calling aletes is the right premise for the end product the argument wants to deliver. So, the, so uh, and this also goes for pseudes, pseudes premises. It's not that the premise itself is false, has a false content, but the premise is uh, true, but functional, it's, it's a functional it's notion. notion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> It's a functional notion of aletheia, or in the theory of truth, you might also call this an ontological conception. So uh, that is true in virtue of doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, yeah, that, that's exactly that's mm -hmm. that's very very helpful to to put things in this way. But uh, I think this this will hold for the large picture. But in this chapter of the posterior analytics. Aristotle seems to be thinking of Aletheia just in the propositional terms, let's say. So this because he has this uh, remark, uh, we, which I have skipped it, but uh, about the uh, 
the diameters, uh, the, the diagonal being commensurate, which is false, blah, 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 blah. But he also has a remark in 1.6, a very difficult text, which I have written about some couple of times, and I have repeated myself. So maybe this time people will be convinced. So, so the reason I have repeated myself is due to 74B, um, uh, 1516, uh, when uh, Aristotle is saying that uh, it is possible to have a conclusion uh, from uh, true premises without demonstrating, blah, 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 blah. In that case, he seems to be taking a uh, test just as proposition and not uh, in the way uh, you have said, ontological way. Or I, I, I'm working on a paper on this and I'm calling this just for uh, convention, the supra propositional way of using a la thèse in the sense that the premise is a la thèse because it is what makes the argument be successful in the uh, product it wants to deliver. That's the, the whole idea. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I mean, uh, thank you very much for this answer. That was very elaborate. And uh, but just uh, just a, sort of something from the top of my head. But, but if you use this conception of aletheia, um, uh, for one two, then don't you run into a self contradiction or into a, some kind of circular expression? Because that's the place where we're supposed to learn why, when, under which circumstances a premise is appropriate. Yeah, uh, that's one reason to maybe to avoid uh, reading uh, true here in this respect. So that's thank you for that. So that's. And an additional reason. So uh, the text seems to treat Alete uh, in its propositional way. Besides, if we read it into uh, the stronger way, whatever we prefer to call it, we might get into trouble. So, thanks. No, no, no. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was very interesting, and I okay. think it's promising. Thank you. So now, Joe, your question before we go to the audience. Ah, thank you. Sorry for my brief disappearance, um, but I'm happy to make a return. And, you know, as a lot of people have been giving you credit for this talk, which is duly, uh, you know, legitimate. So I really appreciate the project and I'm on board. Um, so I don't, this, the, the questions I have aren't really in terms of criticism. They're just legitimate questions. And I apologize in advance if you might have already answered them. I just wasn't able to, to hear. But I'm going to try to put it in a way um, that's slightly different from um, the way Klaus was asking about the, the Porphyrian tree. So I'm not going to put it in terms of the structure of a science. Um, but, you know, um, one thing, uh, I'm very attracted to your relative to the explanandum model. I think it just makes sense. Um, you know, whenever you're trying to explain anything, you only go hum as many bars as you need to to sufficiently illuminate that, you, even if you could explain the nature of something farther back, like the moon, you don't need to in this particular context. You know, you only have to go a certain point to illuminate the nature of an eclipse, a lunar eclipse. You know, which doesn't necessarily require explaining um, all the details about Earth and the moon and whether it's made up of green cheese or not. You know. Um, so uh, I'm on board with that, but I also have to admit that to a certain extent, I've also um, found the um, the whatever standard picture, certain bits of it to be appealing as well. Um, at least in so far as you you get this idea that, and you use this term a lot, to be an expert, right, on a domain. Um, there, it seems like you need to have a kind of holistic idea. And so one of the things that I, I like about your picture is it's not holistic in the sense that you can have, you know, unqualified, whatever scientific knowledge of this explanandum of that and that and that without knowing like the whole body of a science, right? Is that, is that true? I think that's right or not. Maybe with qualifications, but um, okay. But you, well, you, let me just ask the question. The question is: um, Is there anyone that needs to to, uh, to have this holistic knowledge of of a domain? Um, 
And what kind of knowledge would that be? And how would Aristotle describe it? Uh, well, can, can you repeat the last sentence of your question? Because it's uh, absolutely. Can you, so, um, uh, so um, does uh, does anyone need to have a holistic knowledge of a domain oh. for some kind of scientific knowledge? And if so, what kind of person would this be? Okay. Um, for Aristotle. Thank you. Now I understood. Uh, so I, actually, the, the beginning of your sentence was kind of missing here. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Um, well, I would say that this holistic interpretation of posterior analytics uh, has led uh, us to some exaggerations, like uh, uh, um, uh, requiring that someone, in order to have the right explanation for a given explanandum, particular explanandum, must, must master, has mm -hmm whole master over the domain, blah, 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 blah. And uh, to explain that particular explanandum there is to go uh, back to the topmost principles in Porphyrian trees and probably to go to other branches as well, which were not included in the first question of about the explanandum, et cetera, et cetera. But then I, I really think this is a kind of exager exaggeration. Like, uh, for instance, suppose we are talking about uh, biology in Aristotle's uh, way of doing it. And uh, uh, let's just uh, suppose that uh, uh, if Aristotle thinks that it is possible to have uh, full understanding uh, or to have the demonstration, I prefer this vocabulary actually, to have the, the appropriate demonstration of a given explanandum, even without uh, mastering the whole domain. I think it is possible. I think it is possible. But uh, one thing, of course, the guy uh, delivering the appropriate explanation of a given explanandum must know many, many things, many relevant things in that domain. Otherwise, uh, his access to the relevant information, to re relevant explanatory connections would be uh, impossible, would be jeopardized. So, mm -hmm. But what I'm denying is that, well, um, in order to to find the right explanations, yeah. I have to have settled uh, everything else in the domain. So that's sometimes people come with uh, the holistic picture about post prior analytics one theory in that respect too. So we have to finish the historia and collect everything that is true. If something is missing, you're not going to find the demonstrations. And, well, hold on, it's not exactly what I thought he's saying. He's saying some, something different. But um, so this is this is my reaction to to that question. Um, I'm not, uh, let's just say, getting rid of this idea of holistic understanding as describing appropriately what are sort of things a, a scientific discipline looks like. I think mm -hmm. if we if we are going to describe what the uh, geometer expertise is or what the zoologist expertise is we are probably describe it in terms of this holistic understanding but to engage in this project namely to describe why it is this let's just say mental state or this competence of the expert is different from answer the question uh, uh, why exactly uh, what exactly uh, an explanation, an appropriate explanation of a given explanandum consists in? Yeah. This is a different question. They are, of course, interrelated. But. Good. I think that's you where have I a. Hoping, uh, I have a follow up. I, that's where I was hoping yeah. you were going to go. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, you can be uh, have scientific knowledge of geometry, in which case. It is like this Porphyrian, whatever, this this big st holistic, knowing lots of things. Um, but then it also seems like you can have an understanding of 2R, right? Why triangles have angles that sum up to one hundred two right angles or 180 degrees. Um, and maybe, you know, you'll still have to learn, as you said, you can't just be able to parrot this explanation, right? You need, to, if you're going to have genuine understand whatever knowledge of it um you need to know more bits about mathematics but maybe not everything maybe there's after you're sufficiently far in your training um you can be said to have 
you know, knowledge of 2R without mastering every little thing, being an expert geometer, so to speak. Um, so I, I like that idea, but then I wonder um, uh, a question about um, if you really lean on this um, explanandum's relative uh, mm -hmm. interpretation of the kind of understanding, is it right to call it scientific knowledge? This is a question now about the translation because using Klaus's example from what is it, 124, um, it, the, the action as Klaus was pointing out, it doesn't necessarily look like it would be any particular, you know, fall under any particular domain, but you can still say you understand why the person did the way that they it did what they did and so on. Um, and so it's just a question of, um, are we forced to maybe fall back now on Bernier's suggestion of understanding where you don't incorporate the notion of a science into episteme, um, at least whenever it comes to talking about episteme relative to a particular explanandum? Does that make sense? Yeah, does that question? Okay. Just no, one second, Lucas, before you answer, Marta said she had a follow up uh, because she said she thought her question relates to this. Mm -hmm. No, 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 but uh, just answer to what Joe is saying because my follow up doesn't fit right here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, well uh, so uh, I think it's so your question uh, at the end of the day is about how to translate epistemic given all this. Uh, new points about uh, uh, how limited it is in some cases yeah. to appeal to the notion of understanding blah, 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 blah. but yeah I'm well I, I prefer to translate episteme in most relevant cases as scientific knowledge exactly because I'm kind of uh, kind of sorry about the expression kind of fed up with this uh, holistic understanding yeah. uh, trends so <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. and uh, uh, if we uh, well there is the other issues about uh, the, the kind of explanation that does not fall exactly within a given discipline as Klaus has uh, pointed uh, I'm I'm not sure how I would react to that specific uh, example uh, but um, uh, that is a, is, a, is a good question. Maybe there, probably maybe there is <laughs> a non-orthodox scientific discipline <laughs> which, which uh, uh, contemplates the human action. Who knows? But uh, but anyway, um, episteme to katholu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there is um, uh, well, maybe it's. it's is better to to wait and uh, see what Marta has uh, to ask because maybe it's related to what I'm going to say. Because you have asked, so you have asked also at the beginning uh, something about the uh, the uh, potential conflict between uh, being appropriate to a given explanandum and being appropriate to the domain of a discipline. And I would like to add something about that. But I think Marta is related to this, your question. Okay, yeah, so like that's like, I, I think that there are two ways of talking the holistic, the holistic approach. And one is the strict kind of like, you need to have all the knowledge in order to know what is appropriate for the explanation. So that would be like the one that you've been discussing that is very extreme and exaggerated as you're saying. But there is a modest one that is kind of like what I take to be the Socratic one. That is that you can know what is appropriate to a domain or what is appropriate to a kind of explanation without having to have full knowledge of it. So that you're able to kind of get rid of some of some bad explanations without having full knowledge of everything. And you can't get rid of them by, by being aware of the fact that that's the wrong kind or like the, that the concepts that you're using don't belong to the to the appropriate of the of the kind of explanation that will belong to the field without having to have full knowledge of it. So like that's more modest and it still does the holistic thing. That was a point. Um, Thanks, thanks. I, I think you, you're right. I would, I would agree with that. So we might in general, for instance, uh, I mean, not we might, but let's, uh, let's just say a knowledgeable guy from Aristotle's point of view might know a lot of things, uh, the kind he describes in parts of Animals 1, for instance, so that they, they are appropriate to uh, a given domain and even uh, lots of domains within natural science. I I, I see exactly. I, I'm I'm not denying this. So I think it's 
the only thing I want to deny is that some very specific passages, Aristotle is relying in on the weaker uh, way of understanding appropriateness, namely appropriateness to a domain, when actually he's saying that the relevant sort of appropriateness uh, is appropriateness to the explanandum at stake. That's I'm, I'm comfortable with this. But I, I want to add something very quickly, it's a kind of controversial thing, but I, I have already published a paper on, on this, uh, on the, not the motu, the incesso animalium, and uh, um, I think that uh, uh, we need some uh, new research on the kind crossing issue too, because I'm not, I don't buy the traditional view that Aristotle uh, has forbidden the application of uh, principles from geometry, for instance, in the natural realm. I don't think Aristotle is doing this. Aristotle is just, again, being guided by the, let's like say, explanandum sensitiveness, uh, which is, uh, the idea is pretty much uh, this. So you have to explain this explanandum before you, and it belongs to a specific, uh, a genus and belongs to a specific scientific discipline. And it might be the case that given the specific specificities of this explanandum before you, you might have to resort to some principles that come from, for instance, geometry. But what Aristotle says is that the geometrical principle you are going to put into use there is not doing by itself alone the most important explanatory uh, job. He's taken together with uh, stuff that belongs to the domain, and it's it it but it, it it taken together with principles that are appropriate to the domain. In this uh, sense, uh, Martha and Klaus were, were suggesting, and, and and Joe too, and then taking everything together, you might say that um, the, the geometrical principle Aristotle appeals to when he explains the the bending of the of the knee. Uh, is uh, appropriate to the explanandum at stake. And uh, then uh, one might ask, well, but is this uh, geometrical principle appropriate to the domain of the discipline? To be honest, I don't think Aristotle has it's himself raised the issue very explicitly. But I think his reaction would be, well, uh, as much as it helps to deliver the full explanation of that particular explanandum, this geometrical principle turns out to be uh, helpful here. And it, it is not, uh, the word he would use is not allotrion, is not completely strange uh, or inappropriate to uh, the domain of, I don't know, uh, kinesi kinesiology or animal kinesiology or whatever it is. but. This is very controversial, so <laughs> I haven't talked too much about this. Okay, so uh, now we go to the question from the audience. I'm getting here, uh, finding here uh, the observation we have, it's, which is from Professor Paulo Fernando from Unifesh also. And he says the following. Uh, a question about the role of mercatas in the back course with, with epitastai in the posterior analytics. Uh, and he, at, from 71b, 28, 29, tracing back to 71b, 912, seems maybe cause as accidental to the causal explanatory relation. And he says, Aristotle sometimes uses, uses accidental as accidental in a given correlation. Also, Polycletus is accidental to sculpture, qua cause at physics and metaphysics too. And he finishes taking Mercata Sindibacos along such lines as at, at posterior analytics offers additional textual evidence in favor of your reading of the passage. Klaus seems to be agreeing with him. Would you like to say something, Klaus? A follow-up? No. Nope. <laughs> so, Lucas, any comments? It, it, it seems right to me. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Um. So I was muted, but I, I didn't say anything important so far. So I, I'm agreeing with Paulo. I think it's I have developed the, the suggestion he is suggesting. Uh, actually, what I think the 
Simbe because in this context is naming is uh, maybe this particular detail is more controversial, but I think this Simbe because is naming a given item which happens to be uh, an attempted explanatory factor in a failed uh, demonstration, not in a successful one. But it is called Simbebekos just because it is not uh, the most important explanatory factor to the explanandum at stake. Uh, for instance, uh, the idea is just uh, the, uh, that, uh, uh, let us say, the middle term in an attempted explanation uh, might be not the appropriate uh, principle, even when it is an essential predicate of the subject, etc., etc., etc. So, the let us say the the, the things behind uh, the scene and the backstage here is definitely physics, uh, two, three, etc., and uh, all that that stuff. Uh, but also a lot of things are sort of says uh, using Katasim Bebekos as opposed to Katalto in the prior, sorry, posterior analytics, maybe prior to, and topics as well, etc. But that's that's right. That's uh, that's uh, what exactly I'm, I'm doing, Paolo. Thank you. Uh, there is one more quick quick clarification question from Samara Costa. She asks, uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that uh, identifying the primary premises is something explanatory sensitive? She was wondering about that use of the word sensitive. You're muted, Lucas, again, I'm sorry. So why I want to capture with this expression uh, explanatory sensitive is, is actually quite simple. Um, uh, well, I'm kind of tired, so I'm, I'm, I'm retrieving the old examples from tradition, but maybe suppose you want to explain why human beings are mortal or something like that. So that's the, the most uh, traditional example. So, uh, and then suppose you bring in uh, as an explanatory factor the fact that uh, human beings are, um, let's just say, mammals or something like that. So, being mammals is true about uh, human beings. And in actually, as a middle term, it will deliver a sound deduction of the conclusion. But it is not uh, exactly responding to what exactly you want to explain, which is why it is for human beings to be mortal. So when you select mammals as your explanatory factor, uh, I would say this explanatory factor is not being fully sensitive to the explanandum at stake. Uh, that's uh, the idea. I don't know if that helps, but we can uh, add something if this is not uh, uh, sufficient. But uh, this, this idea is important because um, uh, most of the traditional ways of characterizing the six requirements are completely aligned to this uh, approach. So they think that the, the uh, premises being primary, premises being immediate, premises being indemonstrable uh, are things you might attribute to a given premise without uh, taking into consideration uh, the explanatory power of that premise in relation to a given explanandum. And even when Philoponus introduces that distinction between the six requirements into two groups, and he says, well, the second group, namely prior, uh, more intelligible, and cause of the conclusion, they are related to the conclusion. I don't think Philoponus is exactly um, describing uh, exactly what I'm calling uh, explanatory sensitiveness, because Philoponus is taking the idea in very, very general terms. He's not saying that the explanatory, sorry, the, 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 the principle must be uh, exactly responsive, responsive to that explanandum in particular. He's just saying that, well, you know, your premises must be responsive to what is uh, formulated in the explanandum, but it, just in a general way. Um, and this is uh, very important to my, to my story because I think it's also uh, 
give us a clue about how Aristotle's terminology works. Because when Aristotle is uh, saying something about the premises and about the principles, for instance, when he says that the principles are this or that, even when he says that the principles are necessary, he might be thinking, and in my view, he is thinking, or he was thinking on this uh, way in which the principles you have selected uh, explain the explanandum at stake. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, she says actually she's reading your thesis and she will get uh, in contact. She'll be in contact with you by email to ask you for further questions uh, about this. Uh, I think we're through for today. Nobody has any more questions. Gwen, Mark. Okay. Uh, once again, thanks everybody for coming. I would like to thank Marta, Klaus, Breno, Roberto, Lucas, and Joe, who's not here, had to leave to pick up his son. Uh, and everybody who has followed us today uh, through YouTube or Facebook, Professor Marta Jimenez is our next, is our, is our next speaker, and soon you'll be receiving her uh, title by email. Bye bye, everybody. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the very helpful discussion and wonderful discussion. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye.